Hey guys, welcome to Marathon 80 something. I can't even remember what marathon it is. It's 83 or 4, I can't remember. It'll be in the description. But just be assured, if you like weird stories, crazy stories, unreal stories, strange stories that happen to people, and you just love them for the sake of the story, you have found your people. You have found the funky coal Medina of Bigfoot storytelling channels. And I'm so glad you're here. Let's get into some Bigfoot stories. Three really good ones here. So hang on to your weaves. All right, here we go. Here's a North Carolina encounter. The woman doesn't want her name used in the in the story. So I'm just going to read her story to you. It's really good. It's really good. It was 1978 and I was 12 years old. We lived on 70 acres in McDowell County in North Carolina along what used to be Muddy Creek Road. I know it's something else now, but I'm not sure what it is. My dad bought this land out in the middle of nowhere against my mom's wishes. But you know, in 1978, whatever he said went. He cleared the land and laid block and built a basement and then placed a beautiful double wide trailer up there for our family. The driveway was two football fields long. I could see the house from the end of the drive when the bus let me off each day. My mother, my sister and I, we all hated it. It was the country. No, it was the middle of nowhere. The nearest neighbor was three miles away. Seriously, three miles except for the house my oldest sister and her husband were building through the woods on the land my dad had given her. His thought was to build a big farm and his children all to build on the land and raise our families together. This was not going to happen. After we moved in, my folks had the family over for a big family cookout or barbecue. The whole family came, my mama, aunts and uncles, cousins, which we know are our first friends and everyone else. That night, when many had left, my daddy and uncle decided to tell us some ghost stories. There we all sat around the fire with dad and uncle Jack trying to scare us. In those times, we were still kids at 11 and 12 years old, and we didn't have the influences kids have today to harden us up. We loved Andy Griffith and the Waltons, don't you know? Uncle Jack started telling us about the man who lived in the woods because he didn't like noisy children. Of course, we were all scared to death. While Uncle Jack talked, we leaned in to listen and we stayed close, thinking it made us safer. It was pitch black dark except for the stars that shone that August night and the flashlights us kids all held up so tightly. My dad had gotten up and gone. We thought that he went inside. My Uncle Jack said he hunts the woods looking for loud kids now. We have heard he recently moved in close by. And just then, out of the woods came a man with a long beard and he was screaming. Us kids took off running for the house before we realized it was my daddy and that beard was my mom's wig on his face. Oh, they got us. But later that night, all us kids were piled up in one bedroom talking and we heard footsteps on the outside. We figured it was the adults trying to scare us again and just yelled, stop it, dad quit it, and things like that, only to have Uncle Jack and Daddy come down the hall. They weren't the ones outside. It was really strange. A few days later, I got off the bus and headed up the long drive. It was slightly raining, and I stepped off the bus and opened my umbrella and started my long walk home. I walked about 15 feet or so, and I started feeling really alone, all but whatever was shadowing me in the woods. I could hear it walking, walking on two legs. I walked on, scared to death, and trying to stay calm. As you can imagine, for a 12-year-old girl, this is scary. I crossed the creek and got up the hill, and as I started in the door, I heard a deep growl. It ran through me from head to toe. I was hysterical. I made it inside, I grabbed the phone, and made sure no one else was on the line. In those days, country folks had something called a party line that hooked to all the homes in the area. 
I called my mother at work and told her what had happened, and she said it was probably some kind of animal, and for me to just calm down, that I was inside now. In just a short time, my older sister got home, and she walked the same drive, but she didn't hear anything. That night, when Dad got home, Mom told him what had happened, and Dad grabbed a shotgun and went out to check things out. He went out and took a look around and came back and said that he saw some bear tracks, so it had to have been a bear. He told me to be careful and to come straight home when I got off the school bus. I cried and cried and mom decided that us kids would ride the bus to her office and we would ride home with her. That made me feel a little bit better. That weekend, my sister and I made a trail over to where my other sister and her husband were building a house. We made a good trail from our door to hers. It took about 10 minutes to walk the trail, and no one was to walk it alone except for Dad. While we were on our way home from dinner that Sunday, my sister and I were alone on the trail. I was ahead of her, and I heard her say, Hey, do you hear that? I said, What? And I ran back to her because I was moving way ahead up until this point. We stood still, and we heard the rustle of bushes, and then it got very quiet. We walked on rather quickly, and just as we could see the end of the trail, we heard a whoop coming from beside us to the left about 50 feet off in the woods. Then we heard a long, high-pitched whistle come from higher up on the hill behind the house. Then we heard a grunt come from the right side, and we took off running at that point, and we ran inside the house. Mom and Dad said it was our imagination and to quit being so scared. Wednesday after school, my sister and I rode the bus to mom's work, as was the plan, but she had run us home and gone back to work. Someone called in and said she had to work late. So my sister and I were home alone. In those days, we didn't have cable, so we sat there watching TV, and the TV went out. We thought the antenna had just quit working or was out of position. My sister told me that she was going to go out and turn the antenna and for me to yell when it got clear. She turned it and repositioned it several times, but it never helped. She continued to turn and nothing. She came in and she said, it looks like the wire's loose. It looks like daddy didn't even have it in good enough or something. So we turned on the stereo and we listened to music. We did that for a while, and all of a sudden we heard a whap on the outside of the living room wall. We stopped dead in our tracks. What was that, I said. Whap, there it was again. She ran and locked the front door, and there we sat until Mom and Dad got home. We told them what happened, and Dad again grabbed his gun, and he went outside. He came back in a while later, and he said to my mother, All I see are some rocks out in the yard, and the antenna wire has been jerked down. I think they have very active imaginations, and you hate it here, and so do they. They had words, but we went ahead and went to bed. We were working out in the yard planting some fall flowers, and my mother finally heard the sounds that we had been telling her about. We heard knocks and whistles and yells. The first yell she heard, my mother turned white. I mean white like the sheets that we had changed on the bed that Saturday morning. She told us to get inside, and we did as we were told. That night, when Daddy got home, Mom told him what she had heard, and he then again said, You just hate it here, and you're just looking for a reason just to go. They had words again, and again, we just went to bed. Finally, one late fall day, it was getting darker earlier, and Mom, Sister, and I were headed up the drive, and right ahead of us at the creek standing in the drive was not one but two Bigfoot, a female with a much larger male. I remember screaming, and my sister said, What is that? My mom said, Oh my God, no, that's not real. That's not real. Oh my God. They moved off to the left of the drive, and mom gunned it, and up the drive we went. We ran in the house and locked the doors. I was crying, and my sister was in shock, and my mom called my daddy at work. She hung the phone up and we gathered around the window that looked down on the creek. And there in the tree line, we saw the male standing looking at the house and he was swaying from side to side. He was at least eight foot tall and he had long red hair and a strange looking face. 
We heard the call start again, and we actually saw this male Bigfoot start to yell. We now knew that it was his yell because we watched him do it. His female was there with him, so who was he talking to? And that's when the rock started hitting the front of the house. Bam, bam, rock after rock came in and hit the house. It was about 20 minutes and we heard Daddy's truck come up the drive. Mom was flying around the house now and we were just sitting there waiting. We didn't know what to do. Daddy came in. Who put those rocks in the yard, Daddy said. Bigfoot, Mom said. Bigfoot, yes, Bigfoot, a real live Bigfoot. I saw them. The girls are not crazy. I saw them. I'm getting out of here and I'm going someplace where there are people. If you want to stay here and get eaten, you can, but my girls and I are leaving. I looked up to see my mom with a bag packed for each of us. Daddy tried to calm her down, but mom was going to have none of it. As we started out the door, I noticed a smell that was gag worthy and the yells started again. Mom told daddy what it was and he rolled his eyes. He walked us to the station wagon and mom drove us to Mama's house in the city. We never went back to that place and mom wouldn't let us. It wasn't long before Daddy came off that mountain about three weeks later, and he never said why, but I think I know why. Oh, wow. What a scary, horrible event in your life. How much money did y'all lose having to leave that place? I've heard that over and over, that the economic hardships that these Bigfoot put on people who live out of the country, you just can't count it. If you added it all up, you couldn't count it. And I never thought of it that way until somebody actually explained it to me. And I thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I'm so sorry y'all had to move. Uh, Apparently things are okay now. You guys found another place to live and everything's okay. But I thought this was a great, very informative story. And thank you so much for sending it, ma'am. It was really good. Here's an email from Deborah, and this is, oh, this is a good story. So hang on to your weaves. It was Thursday, September the 8th, 2016. I was on a trip from Erie, Pennsylvania to visit a friend in North Carolina. I had rented a car as I didn't think my 20-year-old truck would make it. I had my GPS take me on a route to bypass toll roads on the way down. I was driving for about five and a half hours when I left Route 64 and drove on Airport Road and came down to a little town called Beaver in West Virginia. I made a pit stop at the KFC there, and the woman behind the counter called me sweetheart when I told her I was from Erie, Pennsylvania. And she said I was now in Beaver, West Virginia, which is how I knew where I was. I made a right out of their parking lot onto the Ritter Drive, Route 19, as I was leaving, and I was going slowly as I hadn't picked up speed from pulling out yet, or I'm sure I never would have noticed this. I was coming up on some leaves spread across the road when I noticed the leaves were moving, but there was no wind blowing. I slowed down thinking there may be a critter in the leaves and I didn't want to hit it. I was looking really hard because I could see the leaves moving, but I didn't see an animal. Then I could make out a small bipedal figure about seven or eight inches tall that seemed to be trying to hide itself in the leaves as it tried to get across the road. It looked as if I could see a line of each part of the creature, but it seemed to be cloaked, kind of like what a chameleon does, but not quite the same. I think it was by Cardinal Lane on Ritter Drive. It moved with a ratchet-type movement, rather jerky. I don't know if that was its normal gait or if it was injured. I was driving at a crawl at this time because what I was seeing was so bizarre, and I was trying to make out what it was. I was thinking, what in the world is this thing? It almost looked like a frail stick figure as I could only make out some of it. I thought maybe it was an emaciated squirrel, but they don't walk on two feet. And if it was that skinny, it would be dead, not jerking across the road. It was not a featherless bird either. It had made it to the center line and was attempting to cross the rest of the road when a pickup from the other side came speeding along and just missed it with its driver's side tires. And I saw the leaves in it being thrown. So I don't know if it made it or not, as cars behind me were honking at me to keep moving. 
I thought about turning around to see if I could find it because that is what I would do for an animal. But this was not an animal that I had ever heard about or had seen before in my life, so I wasn't going to take a chance on it being a dangerous, and even more so if it was injured. For the next 60 miles, I had to really concentrate on my driving as I was still scared, and I don't scare easily. The more I thought about it, I thought it may have been cloaked and was picking up the color of the leaves to disguise itself. It reminded me of the way the movie Predator depicted the aliens cloaking themselves. I could see it, but I couldn't make out exactly what it was. As I've tried to rationalize this in my head, I thought maybe it was a reptile or a lizard of some kind, like a chameleon that can turn different colors to hide itself. An octopus can do the same thing, and maybe we have just never seen them to know that they are there. When I got to my friend's house that night, I told her about it. She never doubted me as I'm not prone to making up stories. I'm a very rational person. Her son mentioned something about Bigfoot being sighted down there, and I asked if he had heard anything about a dog man. He said no, so I started to tell them what I had heard about dog men, and when my friend interrupted me and asked if I remembered when she had called me a few years back when she had some large dog-like thing in her backyard. When she brought that up, I remembered the incident as I told her to call the game commission and report it. She said this thing was standing looking around in her backyard a few years after she had moved to North Carolina. It was very large, she said, standing on all fours. The head was higher than the four-foot chain-link fence around her one-tenant house where she had kept a dog fenced in. The dog was hiding in the doghouse, and she was afraid for her cat, so she took a broom and walked out the door to shoo it away, and it started towards her. She jumped back in the door and shut it, and then she called me. I told her to call the game commission, as a wolf won't generally do that. It would prefer to avoid people unless it was rabid. Plus, the only wolves around there would be red wolves, and they aren't much bigger than a coyote. They gave her a runaround and told her that it was just a dog and to call the Humane Society. Besides being very large, she said it had a shaggy gray fur and it had a funny-looking face. She said it really didn't look like a dog, but when her daughter helped her look online, she said none of the pictures of wolves or coyotes looked like it either. She said it had yellow eyes and that it had a mean-looking face that was showing a lot more expression than a dog's face or other animals do. It was more human-like than dog-like, and that is what freaked her out the most. I didn't know anything about Dogman at the time, which was probably best. I would have worried about her a lot. She said she hasn't seen anything like it since, and that's really the last I heard of it. But those are two strange stories I thought I would share with you, and I hope you can get them in a video. Well, we did get them in a video, Deborah, and that was a, that's a real interesting story. I'm curious about this small thing kind of moving its way across the road. Does anybody have any idea what that could have been? I don't know. I've heard some stories about the little people, and I, I don't know anything about them. Nothing at all. Maybe it was something like that. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't even know what to think about that. But I don't doubt what she's saying. That sounds like a really cool experience. And she said it scared her, but it's still, it's interesting to us. You know what I'm saying. But anyway, the whole story was great. And then then her friend had an encounter with a dog man. It's just real interesting stuff to me, and I really, really appreciate her sending that email to me. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, this is a great story sent to me by a man who wants to be anonymous, and I'm going to tell y'all right now. I'm fixing to walk outside and start shooting chickens if they don't shut up. They're driving me absolutely out of my gourd. But let's try to get this story recorded and wrap up this video because it's really good. This happened back in the summer of 2002, but I remember it like it was yesterday. One day while picking up my pay in the war room at Fort Indian Town Gap, I overheard news that my National Guard unit was about to get orders to deploy as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. I was a rifleman with Company C, 111th Infantry, 56th Striker Brigade out of Cutstown, Pennsylvania. I volunteer for state active duty as part of Operation Noble Eagle guarding the Limerick Generating Station. 
I was carrying a full combat load on that detail for almost a year when I asked to be relieved. I really wanted to deploy with my unit. You know, that whole band of brother thing. I guess you have to be a grunt to get it because my civilian friends thought I was out of my mind. I was a 42-year-old infantryman, and I wanted to be sent to an area of hostile fire. I'll look back now, and I guess I was nuts. A buddy offered to take me on a weekend camping trip to a little pay camp site along the banks of West Branch of the Saskahena, just west of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. It was meant to be a relaxing trip before I deployed, and while there, we would drink a few beers, We'd look for Indian arrowheads in the nearby fields, and he was going to give me a flint napping lesson. We soon got bored with the field walking after only finding a few broken projectile points. There was a flowing stream called Big Run, and I wanted to explore it. I've been hunting arrowheads for many years, and I found that almost every stream and spring in Pennsylvania had a small Native American hunting camp at the head where the water first pops out of the ground. It was hot that day, and my friend got tired after a mile or so, and he wanted to turn back. I was determined to find the camp, and I went on alone. I followed the stream for another mile or two when eventually it got so thick with rhododendron that it became nearly impossible to follow. At that point, I started to hear the sound of the highway off in the distance. I found a crushed soda can in the stream. From the can, I came to the conclusion that the head of the stream was somewhere on the other side of the highway and farther away than I was prepared to travel. At the bottom of the mountain, I remembered seeing an old logging road that ran up the gorge to the left of the stream. I decided that would be the easiest and quickest way back to the river. After fighting my way through the thick undergrowth, I finally found a logging path that was about 200 yards to the left of the stream. As soon as I located the path, I found a nice flat spot that had a push pile from making the road, so I decided to scratch around in the pile to see if I could find any traces of flint chips. I have found whole arrowheads in these topsoil piles in the past at other locations. All I found in the pile that day was a few small northern ringneck snakes. It was getting even hotter and I was almost out of water, so I decided to pack up my scratcher and head back down the mountain. I had taken two steps into my journey home, and standing about 60 yards in front of me was the most terrifying thing I have ever seen. Honestly, I would like to think that I'm a fairly brave man, but I was not prepared for this at all. What I saw standing in front of me shook me to my very core, and I instantly froze. A flood of thoughts went through my mind in a second. I wanted it to be a bear in the worst way, but it wasn't a bear. When I realized what it actually was, an overwhelming fear hit me, and I felt like I was going to vomit. It turned and started running towards the stream where I had just come from, and I couldn't believe the speed it achieved in such a short distance. I could clearly see those two massive muscular legs running. The legs alone had to be as tall as me. The thing was probably six foot high at the waist, and it had to weigh anywhere from 800 to 1,200 pounds, and it stood 10 to 11 feet tall. The legs were thick and muscular and made me think of hair-covered telephone poles. The hair appeared to be dark brown, about four inches long. It actually sounded like a bulldozer busting through the rhododendron, snapping branches as thick as my ankles. I remember thinking there's no way I can outrun this thing, and if it wanted to, it could easily catch me. Being unarmed at the time didn't help with the fear factor, and at that point, I knew if I survived that day, I would never venture into the woods unarmed again. To get back to camp, I had to go towards where this thing was standing just a second before. I remember thinking the sounds I heard earlier that I thought were a deer must have been this creature following me. When I made that left uphill to get out of the rhododendron, I must have inadvertently flanked it. My thoughts were, this thing is stalking me. That's when 20 years of infantry training kicked in. 
In an ambush situation, you always charge into the contact and never go any other direction because that's where the real trap is. It sounds crazy, but at that point, I just bolted in the direction of where I first saw this thing. To tell you the truth, I didn't know that I could even run that fast. I never looked back because I was in full panic mode, but I knew if I didn't slow down a little, I would eventually fall being that it was a rocky and downhill area. I thought if I fall and get injured, then I'm going to be in bigger trouble. I slowed myself down a little but kept running for what felt like three miles until I came to the river. I've never told anyone about this encounter until recently after enjoying some of your videos on YouTube. Funny I never even told my buddy that took me on the trip. I'm not sure why I kept it to myself all these years, but you can bet every time I go hunting or into the woods, that day is in the back of my mind. I swear to God that this story is 100% true, and then he signs, he signs his name. Uh, first, let me say, you don't have to swear if these stories are 100% true. I believe every story that comes in here some of them seem a little outrageous to me sometimes. I'll just be candid with you. But who am I to say that this didn't happen to these people? And a lot of people write in stories and they'll say, I, you know, just like this man said, I swear to God, this is 100% true. There's no need for that. You're, you're telling your story in a safe place. All that said, man, what a story. Guy's just out arrowhead hunting. He walks right up on a Bigfoot standing in an old logging road, and then he rushes to where that thing was. So thanks for the story, man. It was really good. Okay, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. I didn't have to shoot a single chicken. They, I ran them all out with a towel. I keep a towel in here. And when they start coming in the door, I just throw it at them and they all scatter. And they all got out. So uh, all the chickens survived. And the video was great. The stories were great. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Okay, so we'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you.